If you feel great for an hour after eating, then suddenly crash, get hungry again, or start craving sugar, that isn't lack of willpower, it's a blood sugar spike. And the good news is that you don't need to cut carbs or wear a glucose monitor or follow extreme diets to stop it. In this video, I'm going to show you exactly how to end blood sugar spikes for good using simple physiology and simple habits that you can apply at your very next meal. I'm Alex, I'm an emergency medicine doctor, and after nearly 10 years in the A&E, I've seen what happens when preventable disease isn't prevented. And my goal now is to help you avoid it in the first place and live longer, healthier lives. So what most people don't realize is that these mid-afternoon energy crashes, the brain fog after lunch, and the relentless cravings for snacks aren't character flaws or signs that you need more willpower. They're your body responding to the roller coaster your blood sugar has been riding all day. The thing is, most of the advice out there focuses on restriction, cutting out entire food groups or spending hundreds on gadgets that track every fluctuation. But the real solution is much simpler, and it's rooted in understanding how your body actually processes food. When we talk about blood sugar spikes, we're not talking about diabetes or disease necessarily, at least not yet. We're talking about the sharp rises in glucose that happen after eating certain foods in certain ways, followed by an equally sharp drop that leaves you feeling worse than you did before you ate. Blood sugar, or glucose, is simply the fuel that circulates in your bloodstream after you digest carbohydrates. It's essential for energy, yes, but when it surges too quickly and then crashes, the impact on how you feel is immediate and undeniable. The reason this matters for everyday life is pretty straightforward. When your blood sugar spikes high, your pancreas releases a flood of insulin to bring it back down. Insulin does its job effectively, sometimes too effectively, and your blood sugar can actually drop lower than where it started. That's when you start to feel shaky, irritable, hungry again, and desperate for something sweet. Your brain interprets this drop as an emergency and sends strong signals demanding quick energy, which is why willpower feels impossible in that moment. Beyond the immediate symptoms, there's a longer term consideration. Repeated spikes throughout the day put stress on your metabolic system. Over months and years, this pattern can lead to insulin resistance, where your cells become less responsive to insulin signals. That's the path towards weight gain that's difficult to shift, towards fatigue that never fully lifts, and eventually to conditions like type 2 diabetes. But before any of that happens, the daily experience of unstable blood sugar is enough to affect your productivity, your mood, your sleep quality, and overall sense of well-being. The key thing to understand is that blood sugar spikes are not inevitable. They're a result of how we eat, of when we eat, and what we do after eating. And that means they're entirely within your control to change. So to flatten blood sugar spikes, you need to understand what actually happens when you eat carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, whether they're from bread, rice, fruit, or biscuits, they are broken down during digestion into glucose molecules. These glucose molecules pass through the wall of your small intestine and enter your bloodstream. At this point, your blood glucose level starts to rise, which is completely normal and necessary. Your pancreas detects this rise and releases insulin, which acts like a traffic controller for glucose. Now, insulin's job is to direct that glucose into cells where it can be used or stored. Some goes into muscle cells to fuel movement, some goes into the liver where it's stored as glycogen for later use. And if those storage sites are full, the excess gets converted into fat. The speed and height of the glucose rise determines how much insulin gets released and how quickly your blood sugar comes back down. What causes the problem is when glucose enters your bloodstream too quickly. Imagine pouring water into a funnel faster than it can drain out. The funnel overflows. Well, your body responds the same way to rapid glucose absorption. A massive insulin response follows. Glucose gets cleared aggressively and your blood sugar drops sharply, often below your starting point. That's a crash. The rate at which glucose enters your bloodstream 
depends on what else is in your digestive system. Fiber slows absorption by forming a gel-like barrier in your intestines. Protein and fat also slow gastric emptying, meaning food leaves your stomach more gradually. When you eat carbohydrates alongside these nutrients, the glucose release is steady rather than sudden. The spike flattens into a gentle wave. Insulin responds proportionally and you can avoid the crash entirely. Okay, so moving on to the three most common cause of blood sugar spikes. So understanding what drives spikes means you can avoid them without restriction or complexity. Now the first and most common cause is eating carbohydrates on their own without any fiber, protein or fat to slow absorption. A slice of white toast by itself or a bowl of cereal with low fat milk or a banana grabbed on the way out of the door all lead to rapid glucose entry into the bloodstream. Although the banana is the least worst choice here. There's nothing inherently wrong with these foods, but eaten in isolation, they create the perfect conditions for a spike. The second cause is liquid calories. And this one catches people off guard all the time because many of these drinks are marketed as healthy. Fruit juice, smoothies, energy drinks, some protein shakes, and even some plant-based milk alternatives deliver glucose in liquid form, which bypasses the slower digestive process this solid food undergoes. Your body absorbs liquid glucose almost immediately, creating one of the fastest spikes possible. Even a green smoothie packed with fruit can send your blood sugar soaring if there's no protein or fat to balance it. Now, the third cause is eating a meal and then remaining completely still. After you eat, your muscles are primed to take up glucose, but they only do so effectively when they're active. So sitting at a desk, lying on the sofa or getting straight into a car after a meal means that glucose stays in your bloodstream longer than it should. Your muscles, which could act as a massive glucose sink, remain inactive and insulin has to work harder to clear the glucose into storage, often resulting in fat storage rather than energy use. These three patterns are everywhere in modern life and recognizing them is the first step towards stability. And now we come to the practical part, the framework that actually flattens blood sugar spikes without restriction or complicated tracking. This isn't about cutting carbs or avoiding sugar entirely. It's about changing the context in which you eat them. The first principle is meal structure, not restriction. Every meal should have a protein floor, meaning a minimum amount of protein that anchors the meal and slows digestion. Fiber acts as the foundation, creating the gel-like barrier I mentioned earlier that prevents the rapid glucose absorption. Carbohydrates aren't the enemy, but they need to be eaten in context, paired with these other nutrients rather than on their own. A chicken salad with a quinoa and olive oil dressing creates a completely different blood sugar response than a bowl of quinoa eaten alone, even though the carbohydrate content might be similar. The second principle is meal order, also called sequencing. And this is one of the most underused strategies for blood sugar control. Research shows that eating fiber rich foods first, followed by protein and fat, and then finishing with carbohydrates can significantly blunt the glucose spike from that meal. The fiber creates the physical buffer. Protein stimulates hormones that slow digestion. And by the time carbohydrates arrive, your digestive system is already primed to process them slowly. This doesn't mean you need to eat in rigid stages, but starting with veg or a salad, then eating your protein and then finishing your rice and pasta makes a measurable difference. The third principle is post meal movement. And it's stunningly effective. Your muscles are glucose sponges when they're active. A 10 to 15 minute walk after eating, or even just standing and doing some light activity like some squats, pulls glucose out of your bloodstream and into your muscle cells where it's used for energy rather than stored as fat. You don't need intensity, you don't need a gym, you just need movement within 30 minutes of finishing your meal. This habit alone can reduce post-meal glucose spikes by up to 30%. And the best part is that it works regardless of what you ate. But even when people understand the principles, there are predictable mistakes that undermine their progress. The first is skipping meals with the intention of eating less. 
only to arrive at the next meal ravenously hungry and overeating. When you're excessively hungry, you eat faster. You choose higher carbohydrate foods for quick energy and often skip the protein and fiber that your body actually needs. The result is a massive spike followed by a crash that perpetuates the whole cycle. Another mistake is relying on low-fat or ultra-processed foods marketed as healthy. Fat-free yogurts, low-calorie snack bars, and diet cereals often replace fat with sugar or refined carbs, which spike blood sugar just as aggressively. These foods are designed to be convenient and really palatable, but they lack the nutrients that create satiety and blood sugar stability. Real food, even if it is higher in calories, performs better metabolically. Some people assume that exercise cancels out poor meal structure, believing they can eat whatever they want as long as they train hard. Exercise does improve insulin sensitivity over time, but it doesn't override the immediate glucose response to a poorly structured meal. A post-workout protein shake loaded with fruit and no fat or fiber will still spike your blood sugar, even if you just finished a workout. Now, the final mistake is focusing exclusively on sugar rather than overall food context. People avoid dessert, but eat white rice, white bread, white pasta regularly, not realizing that refined carbs break down into glucose just as quickly as sugar does. It's not about demonizing specific foods, it's about understanding how different foods interact in your digestive system. So who needs to be more careful? Well, while everyone benefits from stable blood sugar, certain groups have more to gain from applying these principles consistently. If you have a family history of type 2 diabetes, your genetic risk is higher, and maintaining blood sugar stability is one of the most effective preventative measures that you can take. The habits that you build now directly influence whether that genetic predisposition ever become a clinical diagnosis. People with sedentary lifestyles also need to pay closer attention. When you sit for most of the day, which most of us do to be honest, your muscles aren't actively pulling glucose out of your bloodstream, which means your pancreas has to work harder to manage blood sugar. Over time, this contributes to insulin resistance. Adding post-meal movement becomes even more critical when your baseline activity level is low. Poor sleep disrupts blood sugar regulation in ways that most people don't realize as well. A sleep deprivation increases cortisol and reduces insulin sensitivity, making your body less efficient at processing glucose the next day. If you're getting less than seven hours of sleep consistently, your blood sugar control is already compromised before you even eat your first meal. Shift workers like me face a unique challenge because irregular eating patterns and sleep disruption interfere with circadian rhythms that regulate metabolism. If you work night shifts, or rotating shifts, then prioritizing meal structure and post-meal movement becomes even more important to offset those metabolic disadvantages. As always, this is general education based on physiology and research, not personalized medical advice. If you have diabetes or pre-diabetes or any other medical condition affecting your blood sugar control, these principles should complement, not replace guidance from your healthcare team or your family doctor. Now, if you want to experience what stable blood sugar feels like, then here's a straightforward seven-day reset that builds the habits that we've just discussed. This isn't about perfection. It's about consistency and noticing the difference in how you feel. For each meal, follow one rule. Every plate must contain protein, fiber, and fat before adding carbohydrates. So your breakfast could be eggs with spinach and avocado before adding toast. Lunch could be a chicken salad with olive oil before adding rice. Dinner could start with roasted veg and salmon before adding pasta. The carbs aren't eliminated, they're just eaten in context. The next thing is to add one daily movement habit, a 10 or 15 minute walk after your largest meal, which is usually lunch or dinner. Set a timer, put your shoes on and just walk around your neighborhood or your office building. No tracking, no intensity targets, just consistent movement in that post-meal window when it matters most. The next thing to do is to make one drink swap. Replace one sugary or high carbohydrate drink each day with water, herbal tea, or black coffee. 
If you normally have juice at breakfast, swap it for water or eat the whole fruit instead. If you have a mid-afternoon smoothie, replace it with a handful of nuts and a piece of fruit. Finally, set one sleep anchor. Go to bed at the same time every night for seven days, even on weekends, because sleep consistency improves insulin sensitivity and it reduces the next day cravings, creating this metabolic advantage that supports everything else you're trying to do. After seven days, most people notice clearer thinking, more stable energy, fewer cravings, and better sleep quality. Those changes aren't placebo. They are the direct result of stable blood sugar throughout the day. So let me just end with this. Blood sugar spikes aren't something to be feared or obsess over, but they are something that you can control with simple, repeatable habits. You don't need to cut carbs, avoid sugar, or follow extreme diets. You just need to change the context in which you eat, move intentionally after meals, and build consistency over time. The framework is pretty simple. Structure your meals with protein, fiber, and fat. Consider eating those nutrients before carbohydrates and walk for 10 minutes after eating. Those three habits alone will flatten the majority of blood sugar spikes without restriction, tracking, or willpower. And so thank you for reaching the end of this video. If you got some value from it and you found it useful, then please, please, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. What that does is help this video reach more people like you. And I'll see you in the next one.